Good morning. <laughs> this summer, we as a church are going through a series entitled Loving Our World, and the series contributes to our annual theme of, of I'm sorry, I just got that wrong. Um, this summer, we are going through a series called Loving the World Under Your Roof, and this series contributes to our annual theme of Loving Our World. I am Pastor Brent Oakwin, and this is my wife, Janet, and we have the privilege of speaking to you this morning on Loving Your Spouse. And... Um, I have done over 50 weddings at this point in time, and I have seen soaring wedding vows, including my own, obviously, and Janet's. But if we were honest and realistic about how we practically function in life, our wedding vows might go something like this. Um, Janet, I promise to delight and enjoy your unqualified support of me and admiration of me at all times. And Brent, I appreciate how you always put me first and you're always thinking of me. <laughs> and Janet, I will be grateful for your laughing at my every joke and making me feel most important in life. And I promise to enjoy how you perfectly make me feel secure and you never sin against me. And Janet, I will accept your worship <laughs> and strive to live up to your exalted view of me. And as long as you continue to do all of these things... I will continue to give myself to you. All right. That's many times how our lives tend to function in marriage relationship. Now, I understand that getting a couple up here to speak about loving your spouse is filled with potential pitfalls. One danger could be personal hypocrisy, teaching on a topic that we are not regularly practicing. Another danger could be this leaving an inflated view of reality of what's really going on in our lives. I don't want anybody to go away from here thinking they have it all together because we simply <laughs> don't. And first, let me address the first danger, personal hypocrisy. Jan and I plan to communicate to you what we have experienced and done, not about some kind of a Disney Magical Kingdom fantasy. So while I wish I could say to you that Jan and I go on a Date, a romantic date, every Friday night where I arrange a <laughs> carriage ride and sing Barry Manilow's I Can't Smile Without You. <laughs> now, that's not what I do. And I'm grateful. <laughs> Are there moments of that? Romance, absolutely. You know, when iTunes, when iTunes first came out, um, I did make a love song CD with the Barry Manilow song on it. <laughs> Here it actually is, and it says love right here. The CD is a little faded, although our love is not. So. <laughs> but I have not been singing Barry Manilow in karaoke style to her. And I am grateful. <laughs> <laughs> Yet after 22 years of marriage, we have learned a little, that my wife, a little about romance and learning to give to one another. I have learned that my wife enjoys it when I give thoughtful attention to her on special days like Mother's Day, her birthday, and, her, and our anniversary. I learned not just to have a Mother's Day, but now I have a Mother's Weekend, <laughs> where it's all about Janet. And I learned to make the best strawberry shortcake for my wife, which is her favorite dessert. And then my husband enjoys having some time to think and some quiet and time to process when he gets home from a busy day of work that's filled with people. I learned to hold off on reciting everything I'd been wanting to say to an adult when I was homeschooling two little children. I wanted to give him some time before I launched into all the important things that happened to me that day. For our 22nd anniversary this past um, January, I did take my wife on a magical Disney cruise. Um, where we had an awesome time of reconnecting and praying and listening to some messages on marriage and just having a lot of fun together um, as companions. I am glad to have a companion in life to share these last 22 years of life attempting to practice marriage God's way. And um, the Disney cruise was so much better than our honeymoon. <laughs> Which is another story. But it did include Brent angrily walking away from me, getting in the shower, and informing me I'd better be ready to talk about why I was crying when he got out. <laughs> We've come a long way. <laughs> this week, I got an email from Jan Sherwin. She said, she, this is her email, and she, I have permission to share this. She said, hi there. If you're looking for material for your sermon on loving your spouse, you should talk to Ken. 
Seriously, Lorna trained him for 40 years before she died, and I married him, and he's amazing to be with. Um, his goal, he says, is to make me feel like the most cherished woman on earth, and he does, Jan. I love that. If, if you want to hear older men who have had 40 years of trial and error and successes and cherishing their wives, I would encourage you to sit under someone like Ken Sherwin. Or I also think of Rafe, who always calls his wife, can you, can you say it? Pre Pam. You all know it, precious Pam. Okay. While I've learned a little bit about how to have romance and cherish my wife, my wife has also learned how to give, me, give to me in ways that are just delightful as well. Last year, my wife bought me probably the coolest Father's Day gift ever. You know, what do men and boys love? What do we love? Dinosaurs? Did I hear dinosaurs? No, not dinosaurs. <laughs> <laughs> toys. And when you get older, you like bigger toys, gadgets, and cool things. No romance here. Give me some fun stuff. My wife ordered at a huge discount. She loves to get good deals as well. One of the coolest toys ever for me. She ordered it last June in Father's Day, and it finally came in around January. Uh, are you ready to hear what this is? Wait for it. This is, this is the coolest thing ever. It was a very legitimate stormtrooper suit. <laughs> From the movie Star Wars, you know? Who doesn't want one of these? <laughs> when I got it in January, I couldn't immediately cut it out and put it together, but after the counseling conference in February, I set my mind to building this in the um, two months' work, and I got to use it for the first time at the Faith West picnic with little children coming up to me for an hour, little children and sometimes big children as well. <laughs> Um, so it was a great time. However, there was one problem. My home made my homemade voice digitizer or voice changer that you have to have with this suit was not quite working as I hoped. And my wife said to me some of the most endearing and romantic words from a, for a husband um, that I have ever heard. She said this, honey, you really need to put some investment into your voice digitizer. <laughs> What wife on earth would fully support her husband in something like this? An excellent wife who can find, but she's right here. And guess what he'll be opening this Father's Day? A voice digitizer. <laughs> so. so the first danger, hypocrisy. We are attempting to not communicate to you beyond where we are living. Yeah, there's some fun things in romance. But the second danger also is a false impression of reality. It would be not our desire today to rob you of hope this morning. Several of you, um, as we have, struggle in marriage. It is not helpful for Jan and I to present something to you that is out of reach, um, nor not in line with reality in our lives. If you leave with the impression, again, oh my, I could never be like them, or we have failed because we have made this about or we have failed, if that's the impression you leave with, we have failed because we have made this about us and we have robbed you of hope. We're not any better and we also have many struggles. Today, we want to really convey a single concept to you about loving your spouse that is within the reach of all of you, married or single. And I did say single as well because I think the concept that we'll develop here is something that you can do in any relationship, although it is highly important and essential in your marriage relationship, but you can cultivate this in all relationships that you have. What we're going to talk to you about today is loving your spouse by being a safe place for your sin to be exposed, okay? Now, Janet's going to stand here as a beautiful trophy wife as I, as I uh, do a little bit of scripture <laughs> exposition for you in just a moment. So, if you will, please turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 2 and 3, which is on page 2 in the front section of the Bible in the chair in front of you. Okay? Loving your spouse by being a safe place for his or her sin to be exposed. Whether single or married, you can be providing a safe place for sin to be exposed and dealt with in your relationship. Genesis chapter 2, start, start, we'll start together in verse 7. 
Here's what the word of God says. Then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being. The Lord God planted a garden toward the east in Eden, and there he placed the man whom he had formed. Out of the ground the Lord God caused to grow every tree that is pleasing to the sight and good for food. And the tree of life also was in the midst of the garden, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Stop for just a second. The picture that God is painting there of this first account of Adam and Eve in the first man and woman is of a beautiful paradise sanctuary that God made for Adam. Now jump down to verse 15. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it. And then the Lord God said, It is not good for man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. There's some verses there about how God then paraded the animals by Adam to demonstrate to him that there was, he was alone and there was not a companion for him. So now look at verse 22. Then the Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. And the man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This one, this one is compared to the animals. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Now lock onto that final, final statement there. They were naked and not ashamed. In the first paradise sanctuary that God created for the first married couple, that final description of the relationship is that Adam and Eve are naked and not ashamed. What does that mean? That imagery has many implications, but at least one implication is that there was nothing between Adam and Eve, not even a garment of clothing, nothing between them. Nakedness indicates that they were fully exposed, imagine that, fully exposed to each other and to their environments and to God. And in their full exposure, there was no fear, no place, no hiding. There was no thought of what would happen if Okay, she sees that he, has, he doesn't have a six-pack but a two-liter right here. You know, there was no thought of that fear. <laughs> Just for a moment, imagine if you were fully exposed right now. All of you, and not just your physical body, but all of the ugliness inside of you and me. Just for a moment, imagine that. Imagine being fully known now but also fully loved. Wouldn't that be a safe place to be? Not being rejected, but loved. Not being condemned, but cherished. Not being shamed for your nakedness or the problems of being exposed, but in some way, the other person covering you and just loving you. If that were true in your life, full exposure, but fully loved, There'd be no shame, no fear, but simply you would be able to love others as well. Let's continue now and see what happened to that safe place for Adam and Eve. Now, if you will, look at Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said, You shall not eat from the tree of the garden. The woman said to the serpents, from the fruit of the tree of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat from it or touch it or surely you will die. And the serpent said to the woman, you surely will not die. For God knows that in the day that you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was delight for the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise... She took from its fruits and ate, and she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. At this point, folks, at this point, Adam and Eve ceased worshiping God and put themselves on their own personal throne to do what they wanted. They became interested in their own desires and not God's. Verse 7, then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, 
And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. Right there. The first sin of pride in exalting themselves resulted in an inherent recognition that something was wrong. Notice now how they had something to hide. They were broken. And they <clears throat> set themselves and all of us on a path of covering ourselves. Because we know something is wrong. There is no safe place to hide anymore. Well, not until we get to something in the New Testament. Where is the safe place to hide? Verse 8, Then they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God. There was not a safe place now. Then the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Who are you? And uh, Where are you? Not who are you. <laughs> Verse 10, and he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. There now is the fear of exposure. I have something to hide because I'm imperfect. I'm flawed, I'm broken, and I'm guilty. Verse 11, and he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you not to eat? And the man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me from the tree, and I ate. And in continuing their focus on self right then, you see right there in Adam's words, a crucial problem in our marriages today. Adam, in order to exalt himself, had to put down his wife and attempted to rescue himself at the expense of his wife. She did it. Remember in Genesis chapter 2, he was saying, this one is flesh of my flesh and bone of my bones. In Genesis chapter 3, he's saying, that one, that one, she did it. Right there, you have condemnation from Adam when he should have been owning his own sin and appointing her toward God. Right there, you have rejection from Adam when he should have been accepting because he saw that he, saw that he was just like her. Did Adam think that his course of action of blaming his wife would result in romance that night? <laughs> or a new stormtrooper outfit? <laughs> Will a date night solve that problem? Will a carriage ride cover them so they have no place to hide anymore? Will a box of chocolates remedy this problem? Romance would not solve this problem. The greatest problem in our marriages is not that we are not having romance, although those, those are delightful things. Marriages are not built on romance. The greatest problem in our marriages is that we are sinning and not recognizing it and blaming the other person. Adam created a hostile environment of condemnation and judgment and superiority and rejection for his marriage because of his self-centeredness. And the opposite of a hostile environment for a marriage is a safe refuge where each other's sin can be exposed and covered fully by God in his provision and then where each of us or each of you is learning how to grow in modeling God's love for us. So in the time we have left, Jan and I are going to talk to you about just six ways to create a safe refuge in your home for your sin to be exposed as you learn to love your wife or your husband. The first step is this. Recognize that the greatest problem in marriage, okay? Here it is. Recognize that the greatest problem in marriage is your own self-centeredness. Janet can start on this one, okay? <laughs> I got this one. The, the, okay. <laughs> I will have my turn in just a moment. So. Before I was married, I believed that when I got married, um, I would finally have someone who understood me. I would be known. I would be loved. And I would never be lonely. Just a bit self-centered. When we got married, I brought that same selfish, insecure pattern into our marriage. Um, the first years included a lot of crying, which is Brent's favorite. Yeah. <laughs> we were growing and working through problems biblically, and I'm very thankful for that. It, it wasn't always horrible, but I did have a lot of sin that the closeness of our relationship surfaced. 
I remember, and I do distinctly remember, when God allowed me to begin to understand that I wasn't truly loving Brent when I was trying to make him happy all the time. I was trying to make him my God. I was functionally behaving as if I needed Brent, and that didn't allow me to actually love him. I was too busy clamoring for him. I couldn't love him or help him. He couldn't have flaws or weaknesses because he was my God. You know what that was? That wasn't really trying to please him. That was really clamoring to get him to love me. Total self-centeredness. That was eye-opening, and it began a journey on the path of learning what would it actually mean to just need God and then love Brent. And it's not easy, but it's actually much easier than trying to make him a god. What a cruel thing for me to do to anyone. Secondly, we would encourage you and what we have tried to see in our own marriages, seeking to understand our own patterns of pride and idolatry and self-centeredness. The more Jan and I grow in Christ, the more we see the depths of our sin. 22 years ago, I could not have told you the way that my sin manifests itself. Yes, I knew I sinned in my behavior. I did bad things occasionally, but I did not understand the roots of it the heart behind it. Now, I'm more aware than ever that my pride, of my pride of wanting an easy life, and it manifests for me. It manifests for me in patterns of like worry and fear in my life, particularly when it comes to how my ministry responsibilities are going or not going. And you put yourself in this position as far as your responsibilities, men. In moments of worry and fear, I am more distant from my wife. In moments of worry, I become more critical and unthankful for all that she does. Many of you have heard the story about one day when my PhD work wasn't going well. And I came home and I was upset. I was worrying and fearful and then I was unthankful for my wife. But you've heard this story, possibly, that there were no bacon bits on the salad. (laughs) I love bacon. (laughs) I really love me. (laughs) But the root of all of that was my prideful worry and fear over hard things in my life. Janet now knows my patterns, and while she didn't have bacon bits that night, instead of judging me, the next night she had like a five-pound bag of bacon bits from Sam's the next night. So (laughs) she knows me. Also in the early years of our marriage and my ministry here, My fear and worry would result in what could be termed sometimes despair when a member, a church member, or a regular attender that attended that I had invested in heavily, you know, discipling, would reject my counsel or reject me and may even reject the church and move on. Notice where my focus was on myself. What I did not say was that my despair was over him or them rejecting Christ. Essentially, my despair was a self-centeredness focus on me being perceived to be rejected. My despair would also make life very difficult for Janet when I was not attentive to her, but consumed with my own ministry problems. But God used these kinds of incidents to show me my patterns of pride, selfishness, and idolatry. We all have the patterns. You may only be recognized, okay, I occasionally sin. All of us have patterns of pride and selfishness. How many of us? How many of us? All of us. If we are not aware of our own patterns of pride and selfishness, we will continue in the same patterns. If you are not aware, if you are not aware of your spouse's patterns, then how can you possibly help them? One of the resources that has helped us both in seeing our patterns is the teaching that we have received on the hearts, and you can watch a three-part video series if you want to. The the, the teaching that uh, has helped me probably the most in seeing my patterns is the teaching on the heart of change. Free downloads, free watching right there at the website, faithlafayette.org slash heart. You can write that down if you want something that will help you understand those patterns in your life. Thirdly, what do we do when we see these patterns? Well, the first years of our marriage... Um, I don't know that we had learned a lot about how to help each other 
to know that our marriage was going to be a safe place for the exposure of our sin. Instead, we functioned more like competitors and not teammates. Not that we didn't enjoy each other, but if one of us needed to confront the other, which is going to happen, um, immediately, instead of repenting, we would get defensive and point out the other person's flaws as well. Being confronted was not only uncomfortable, it wasn't safe, or it didn't seem to be. I also remember a time when we were meeting with another young couple, helping them with some conflict in their marriage. Brent brought up an area that I struggle with, with my permission, um, and then he said, she'll probably always struggle with that, and that's okay. I remember at first thinking, I'm not really sure how to take that. <laughs> Did he just say she'll never change? But um, really, it was freeing. He was seeing that I may never be free of that pattern of sin in my life. And instead of being impatient, as I can so easily be, how many times are we going to talk about this? Um, he was going to help me in the same area over and over. And he was acknowledging he's ready to do that for the rest of his life. As I seek to repent daily and moment by moment as I see it. What a picture of God's help to me. Often we think of sin and repentance as something well, that we do once in a while. Repent. I repent over the, you know, kind of like I sinned last year. or I, So I repented last year. Like, oh yeah, I remember repenting once when I was in college. I repented a couple of times. But next year, let me, let me put that in a more biblical context by a historical example here. Next year is the 500th anniversary of a famous event, okay? Don't say it's, you know, my birthday or anything like that. 500th <laughs> anniversary. Does anybody know what that is? 500th anniversary of a famous event. 500 years ago, something happened. Next year, something happened. How about this? October 31st, 1517, Martin Luther nailed the 95 Thesis to the door of the Wittenberg Church, Castle Church. Okay? That was on the tip of your tongue, wasn't it? Okay. To begin the dialogue about heretical practices in the church of, sell, of selling indulgences. Martin Luther was um, <clears throat> helping or trying to stimulate thoughts about what true repentance was. His first thesis was this. When our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said, repent, he willed that the entire life of a believer be one of repentance. The entire life. As we have said, a safe place is where you recognize that the biggest problem in our marriage is me. And then we're growing in our understanding of our patterns of sin. Not only year by year, month by month, day by day, but also moment by moment. Christians are to repent and live a lifestyle of repentance. Turning from selfishness to love moment by moment when you wake up in the morning. That has been a growing feature of, of how we have been able to create a safe place in our marriage. So that means more often now, more often, not perfectly, <laughs> when Janet and I are in a tense moment and not seeing eye to eye, we can quickly ask ourselves the question, is this the typical pattern of Brent's worry and fear or pride or is this the typical pattern of Janet's struggles cropping up again? And more often the answer is yes. And I can see it now and then we turn. Janet and I are now quicker to repent moment by moment than shift blame, which was our tendency, Adam and Eve's tendency in the Garden of Eden there. Fourthly, you can see on the screen, Gaze at how Christ has fully covered you and your sinful patterns as deep as they go in your life. <clears throat> I know it sounds silly, but I actually used to think that needing Christ, needing Brent, is what made Brent and I close. If I actually got to the point where I had such a close relationship with Christ that I didn't need Brent, I feared that that would mean we wouldn't be as close to each other. Uh, but... I have grown in recognizing I need Christ um, and to realize I don't need Brent. And that has freed me. I'm freer to see him as he is. 
I'm not in what I want him to be. I'm freer to love him more and help him and not be angry that he's just a fellow traveler. Um, and we're closer now than we've ever been. And that just makes sense. We're on the same path. We're desiring to walk toward Christ, and then we get to help each other draw closer as well. Remember earlier when I said, just for a moment, imagine if you were fully exposed, all of you, not just your physical body, but all the ugliness inside of you. How terrifying is that? Entering into any relationships, okay, marriage, when you're reaching out here at church, anytime you enter into a relationship, a relationship by nature of you have two people together has virtue of exposing our sin and bringing us face to face with our lack of genuine love for others. And that's why some people choose to be alone all the time and not be in community because they're afraid of being exposed. The marriage relationship in particular exposes the core of our being as hypocrites. When we make these soaring vows to love forever, but we don't, that is pretty ugly to see. Again, just for a moment, imagine all the ugliness externally and internally in you. Imagine being fully known through and through and yet not being rejected but loved, not being condemned but cherished, not being shamed for your nakedness of soul but being covered and cherished with the garments of salvation in Christ. The gospel of Jesus Christ teaches us that we are more wicked than we could ever know, but we are more loved than we could ever imagine. So there is no safe place for exposing the patterns of our sin without something to cover the guilt and shame, and that's the gospel. Here is what I would ask us to pray in our relationships, married or just in general. Father, through our relationships, expose the depths of our sin. But Father, don't do it without showing me afterwards the depths of the grace that you cover me with in Christ. Jan and I have grown in our understanding of the gospel over the last 22 years together. And one of the things that has been helpful to us is Milton Vincent's resource on a gospel primer. There are many little meditations on there as we have grown that we have found helpful in pointing us toward Christ so that we rest securely in Christ and are safe there first. We find that meditating on how Christ has loved us in the depths of our wickedness allows us to humble ourselves and more quickly repent. When I understand the gospel, I'm not shocked by my daily need to repent. And each time I repent... It's not self-pity. I actually grow in my gratitude for the gospel and for Jesus and what he did. When I'm, today, when I'm not abiding close to Christ, I still sin in the same ways I always have. I've not changed. I'm just covered. My sin is not any prettier than it used to be. But the hope is that we can see it early in each other and just point each other back to the cross. Not judge each other, not appease each other, not try to impress each other or compete with each other, but see the sin patterns, come alongside, reassure each other of our love and commitment, and take each other to the cross. What a privilege. And we get to be a taste of the gospel of grace to each other. As we learn to, number five there, respond compassionately to each other's patterns of selfishness because I know how deep my own sinful patterns go, and I also know how deep God's grace goes in my life. That enables me to show compassion when I see it in my spouse. We see the sin in each other far more than anyone else does. What are we going to do with that? Will we use it against each other? That's what competitors do. But a safe place is not for competitors, but for companions. We're on the same team. We actually had family shirts made to remind ourselves that we're on the same team. We picked our favorite colors. We have a verse there, Ephesians 4, 15, speaking the truth in love, we grow up in Christ together. Uh, we did that for our children as well. It was just a reminder that we're on the same team. Teammates can show each other's weaknesses. They've got each other's back. Not that we excuse each other's sin, but we're a safe place for it to be exposed. And that... That has been so freeing for our family. 
One day, I remember coming into the kitchen from our garage, getting out of my car, walking into the kitchen, and I was really mad. I don't even know what it was about. It was so important, I have no idea what it was. <laughs> but it, it was horrendous at the time. And poor Brent is standing in the kitchen. It wasn't even about Brent. I don't even know what it was, but he happened to be standing there and he had no idea what was coming. I came in and I started complaining angrily about whatever it was. I don't know about you, but there are times that I can justify my sin. I can actually convince myself that this is righteous anger. Well, this wasn't even one of those times. I knew. I don't, have you ever been there? You hear it coming out. You know how sinful and petty and wicked it is, and I couldn't shut up. <laughs> it just kept coming, and it's ugly. Now, I'm mad at Brent because he sees it. He hasn't even done anything yet, but I'm sinning profusely. I can't stop. I'm really mad, and I'm looking at him thinking, yeah, I bet you're judging. Now I'm mad at him, and he hasn't even done anything yet uh, because I know he has every right to confront me, and I'm mad that I am so exposed because I can't even justify it with, well, you don't understand. I, it was just, I had nothing. So I finally took a breath, and when I did, he just said, come here, and he hugged me. Oh. oh, I know, I know. And I started sobbing because I knew I was wrong and I asked forgiveness. Now, he doesn't always do that because some people are going, oh, well, if I had a husband like that. He doesn't always do that. I know how to provoke him, okay? <laughs> I know him well enough to do that too. But in that moment, he was a safe place for my obvious sin to be exposed. He loved me anyway. He prayed with me. He helped me go to the cross and repent. Um, in learning how to love each other, we've been able to understand the gospel just a little bit better. When I remember that day, I think, that's what God does for me mm. all the time. Brent can't do it perfectly because he has feet of clay like me. But God, when I'm throwing my spiritual tantrums over something ridiculous, is going, come here. That was such a help to me. I understand that. And then I get the opportunity to incarnate that truth for Brent, to be that safe place or refuge for him. Number six, um, as you respond compassionately, then point your spouse to the truth. When the kids were younger, it was not easy for me to handle a lack of full night's sleep. In addition to loving bacon, I love sleep. Um, <laughs> you know, children at an early age, they struggle with bad dreams. They struggle with, you know, being scared at night. And I'm and when they were scared, I was angry. And um, <laughs> Janet learned how she could help me by handling many of those incidences in the evenings. But when I did get up to help a child, she helpfully reminded me of truth. She pointed me toward Christ during those times. Going through some of the memorabilia in regard to my son Joshua's graduation recently from high school reminded me of this, my struggles in the, when, um, uh, a while back ago. I found a note from my son. It was precious when he was 10. Dear Daddy, thank you for putting up with me. I can tell sometimes you get impatient. That's what <laughs> God will strengthen you. Love, Josh. <laughs> Out of the mouths of babes. And Josh, too, was learning that we can see each other's sin and help each other be, because we're on the same team. Also, I mentioned to you about my fear and my worry and my occasional despair. Janet has learned to speak with truth to me in love. I don't always want to hear, Brent, what is required of you to have a growing ministry, to have people always respond to truth? No, Brent, what is required of you is to be faithful. That's the truth. Often Janet, in a moment of my fear and worry, responds by saying, Brent, let's pray which is exactly what she should do. And that's exactly what I don't want to do at the moment in my flesh. But grudgingly I say, okay, and that is the solution as she directs me back to Jesus. There is a truly safe place. Mm -hmm. when, we're, when we're growing in numbers one through six, you will have a safe place. We can thank the Lord that you have, you have become a safe place for sin to be exposed. So spouses, if you're doing this, okay, now, sometimes in the, the reason why 
marriages are struggling because nobody is doing this. But if both people are doing one through six, you will truly have a taste of Eden, free to be exposed. If only one person is doing this in a marriage, okay, over time, if one person is doing it, the one person is providing a safe place that will soften the other person, possibly. A safe place to be exposed. And truly, romance, gifts, getaways built on that. We don't build our marriages on romance. We build it on numbers one through six. Truly is a Garden of Eden type of experience. So marriages are not built on romance, but God's righteousness. And the reason for lack of God's righteousness in our marriage is because each of us, each of our sins... Loving your spouse in this way creates a safe place for sin to be exposed. And then we together lock arms and point each other toward Christ. Let me give you, in closing, just a few resources. A book that kind of captures what we've talked about is When Sinners Say I Do. So if you're interested in just going deeper, maybe check out that book. And also, go to the faith website and some other just very, very practical resources if you just want to list how to love my spouse, how do I begin to cultivate understanding my spouse more. 50 questions. Search for these terms. You write these down if you want to. 50 questions to ask your spouse. Ways a husband may express love to his wife. Practical ways to show love for your husband. Capture those on our website and you'll find some helpful resources there. Now... Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you about loving your spouse today, and um, let's go to our Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Father, for the blessing of marriage. Thank you, Father, that uh, you have designed it to be um, an exposing place for our sin so that we might learn to grow in our appreciation of Christ, of how Christ has covered our sin And then we can learn to love as Christ has loved us and make a safe place for one another. Father, for singles here in their relationships, I pray that they would help to be a safe friend to those around them so that their unbelieving and believing friends will find a safe place for compassion and truth with their friendship. So Father, we pray these things and we pray that you would help us to individually be a safe place for others. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.